My name is Sam Vaknin, and yes, I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I have made a series of videos about the borderline, the borderline woman, um, the, wom the female patient with borderline personality disorder. Of course, it is true that borderline is also diagnosable among men, but the way it had been defined and treated and studied and was pretty frankly male chauvinistic. And several traits and behaviors attributable or attributed to borderline patients reflect cultural and societal mores of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, when the borderline diagnosis was sort of coalesced around a group of scholars, all of them, of course, male. There are also value judgments inherent in the diagnosis, etc., etc. So consequently, 75% of people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder have been historically female. And that's why I'm dedicating much more attention to the female borderline, uh, borderline patient. Additionally, a recent research, the bleeding edge research in psychology, tends to demonstrate, or, or to, to, to my mind, prove conclusively that borderline personality disorder in women is actually another name for psychopathy, factor two psychopathy, not the male variant, which is factor one psychopathy, not primary psychopathy, but secondary psychopathy. I discussed all these in previous videos, but in all these videos, I use one term repeatedly and people have written to me and justly so that i haven't clarified i haven't made this term that i'm using rigorous i'm using interchangeably terms like rejection humiliation abandonment this that and i didn't clarify what do i mean by rejection how do how do various cluster b personality disorders perceive rejection and how do they react differentially to rejection in, in different ways. So rejection is, is, of course, any situation where a trait, a behavior, or an inner process, an external object, an internal object, an emotion, an effect, the expression of emotion, or a cognition, including an emotional cognition, for example, wishes. Uh, all these are not accepted by someone who has significance in the rejected person's life. life. So it's not enough to be rejected. You need to be rejected by someone who means something to you. Someone whose presence in your life fulfills or caters to important, um, impo important emotional needs facilitates or catalyzes important psychological processes, psychodynamic processes. Um, in all cluster B personality disorders, there's a problem in relating to an intimate partner. In some of them, there's approach avoidance, repetition, compulsion. In others, there's inability to interact with other people as full-fledged human beings. So this, these patients prefer to interact with internal representations of their intimate partners. In yet other, other cluster B disorders, there's a problem of developing any kind of emotion, positive emotion, like love, or intimacy, or loyalty, um, etc., etc. So that, there are massive, massive problems, uh, almost intractable and foundational problems in the way patients with cluster B personality disorders relate to intimate partners. And this is because in all these disorders, perhaps with the exception of psychopathy, in all these disorders, it's an intertwining of arrested development. It means the child's development was at some point stopped or seized. And so m many of these patients are actually children, um, psychodynamically speaking, psychologically speaking, they're children. A combination, an inter intertwining of this with attachment dysfunctions or attachment disorders, or, or at the very least, dysfunctional attachment styles, an avoidant type of attachment, a, a paranoid type of attachment, uh, you know, attachment that doesn't go all the way 
attachment that that doesn't dare call it that doesn't dare call uh, say its name um we combine these two a child with attachment problems and you get a picture of the typical cluster b patient well the only exception might be the psychopath we'll come to it in a minute but first when we say rejection by an intimate or significant other um significant intimate partner we we need to ask whether the rejection is real or perceived is it sufficient for the rejection to be merely imagined or anticipated predicted the answer is yes because of magical thinking in cluster b personality disorders there is no real distinction there is no distinction between reality what's happening outside and what's happening inside the patient's cognitions and emotions are perceived as external entities and in this sense Kernberg was right when he said that some of these disorders are on the border of psychosis. There is no, the, the boundary between out there and in here, the, this boundary is very blurred. And it's blurred because the child was not allowed to develop boundaries, was not allowed to separate from the parent and individuate. So people with cluster B personality disorders are unbounded. They have severe problems with boundaries and consequently everything is one big melange. Everything is one big salad. The outside, the inside, external object, internal object. So when, when the cluster B patient imagines abandonment, anticipates it or predicts it, in his mind or her mind, it had already happened. Whether it, has, it had really happened or not, is meaningless to ask because the internal environment is perceived as reality, as real as reality. And so the answer is yes. Both real, real rejection and perceived rejection are of equal status with an equipotent. They have the same power. Now this creates enormous problems. First of all, the patient reacts to internal processes which are not transparent to the intimate partner. The intimate partner doesn't know what, what has happened suddenly. And this is, of course, the source of mood lability and dysregulated emotions. The reactions of the cluster B patient have to do as much with in internal dynamics as they have to do with anything, with any external trigger or stimulus. So the intimate, part, the intimate partner can be absolutely the same, can be nice and caring and loving and engulfing and you name it. And suddenly his cluster B patient intimate partner goes haywire, goes awry and, and does crazy things, um, behaves recklessly, cheats on him. Um, I mean, and, and he doesn't know why. He doesn't know why because of course, None of us has access to anyone else's mind. And so he doesn't have access to, to his wife, for example, who is, a, who is a borderline. He doesn't know what has happened to her. Why has, she, why has she changed so much? And in some of these disorders, I mentioned borderline, the changes could be literally from one hour to the next. So it's very, very difficult to cope with this roller coaster. That's in the intimate, on, from the intimate partner's point of view. From the patient's point of view, the patient needs to be consistently, constantly hypervigilant. The patient needs to have a kind of radar, or always on radar, um, scanning for possible rejection, scanning for possible humiliation, monitoring, observing, supervising, mm, controlling, making sure that no, no abandonment is forthcoming, no humiliation, no insult, no... And so this process, this behavior is known as hypervigilance. Narcissists, for example, are very hypervigilant because they, they, because all these patients react to internal processes. The hypervigilance is directed not only to the, at the outside, but it's directed at the inside. The patient monitors his or her inner landscape as though it were reality and reacts to this inner landscape magically as though it, it had transpired in reality even though no one else around the patient sees anything or observes anything or realizes anything it's totally crazy me now each of the cluster b personalities reacts differently to actual or perceived rejection the narcissist reacts with narcissistic rage to what he perceives to be narcissistic injury. 
Rejection, real or imagined, I repeat, rejection is, of course, an undermining of grandiosity, a challenge to grandiosity, because it implies, first of all, that the narcissist is not omnipotent. He cannot control everyone. He cannot micromanage behavior of people around him. And they can reject him, which is an outcome he did not want. And he challenges his omniscience. Narcissist thinks that he is all-knowing. But if he is all-knowing, how could he have not, how, how did he fail to, to, to predict the abandonment and the rejection? So rejection challenges all the elements of the narcissist's grandiosity. It also challenges his perfection. He thinks of himself as a perfect being. He's a perfectionist. But also he thinks of himself as a perfect being, like God. So being rejected is implied criticism. It's saying, you know, you're far, far from perfect. Not only are you far from perfect, but I have found someone who is better than you, in the case of cheating, for example. So the Nazi's grandiosity is undermined and challenged so severely and so profoundly that he reacts with panic, a pa in effect, a panic attack, converted into aggression in the form of narcissistic rage. The primary psychopath regards rejection as a mere hindrance or obstacle. Primary psychopaths are very goal-oriented. They're called calculating, scheming, heartless, reckless and callous machines. And so they regard every rejection as a mere obstacle on the way. And they obliterate rejection. They are very vindictive, so they punish the rejecting party. They convert immediately frustration to aggression. That's the dollard hypothesis. They convert to aggression, and then they use this aggression, coupled with impulsivity and defiance, to punish the source of frustration and to, if possible, eliminate him or her. So they go as far as needed. If the rejection is utterly detrimental to the interests of a primary psychopath, primary psychopath will not hesitate to murder the source of frustration. But usually it doesn't come to that. Primary psychopath simply damages the source of frustration, and exacts retribution in order to restore the inner balance, restore the cosmic justice. As a psychopath is as grandiose as the narcissist, of course. Psychopathy includes a very pronounced dimension of grandiosity. The secondary psychopath is something completely different. Remember that the secondary psychopath actually has empathy and emotions. For the secondary, as far as the secondary psychopath is involved, everything in life is a power play. It's about establishing power matrices. Who is on top? Who is winning? It's a competition. Um, who will subjugate whom to her or his will? And so rejection is perceived as checkmate, exactly like checkmate in chess. And the secondary psychopath will then become primary, having been hurt, having been hurt. Rejection hurts the secondary psychopath the same way it hurts the borderline, which is one excellent reason to think that borderline is actually a secondary psychopath. The secondary psychopath is hurt by rejection, is in agony, excruciating, life-threatening existential pain. And so to revert this, to survive, he, he becomes a primary psychopath he or she become, becomes a primary psychopath and then acts as a primary psychopath would. Retribution, power, aggression, defiance, dis destruction, recklessness, hate, you know. So the secondary psychopath is the worst of all worlds. It's, is, it, she's as grandiose as a narcissist, as aggressive, dangerous, violent, callous and reckless as a primary psychopath and suffers miserably uh, is as labile and as emotionally dysregulated as a borderline. That's by far the worst, the worst manifestation of cluster B disorders. A classic borderline personality disorder patient, let's say, for example, a shy personality, a, a shy borderline, she would experience rejection she would translate rejection, even the slightest rejection. Honey, I can't, I can't see you this evening because I have a work uh, dinner. I have, a, I have a dinner with my boss. You know. Or I suddenly have to travel for three days to New York. I have some, some things to do. I mean, she would interpret this 
as rejection and immediately interpret catastrophize. She would project, extrapolate the rejection to full-fledged abandonment. So in the borderline's mind, every rejection, never mind how minimal, minute and justified, is abandonment. And she would react to it disproportionately, catastrophically, as if she were abandoned. She would split the object of frustration. She would split, for example, if she has an intimate partner and she wants to talk to him and he can't talk because he's in a meeting. She would immediately interpret this as abandonment. She would say, he doesn't love me anymore. He doesn't like me anymore. He thinks I'm bad. And so, so she splits him. She then sees him as a bad object, as a secondary object. She forgets all her love for him, all the caring, all the compassion. I mean, she hates his guts. She wants him dead. Splitting is that extreme in classic borderline. And then the splitting would lead to object inconstancy, would be coupled, I'm sorry, with object inconstancy, because he's far from sight, he's out of mind, he doesn't exist. She will, in other words, erase him completely. The, she would convert him into an evil, dangerous, unsafe figure, a villain. Then she would delete him from her life, erase him completely. And then she's capable of doing absolutely anything. She can undermine him, sabotage him, shame him interrelationally, in other words, for example, in work settings, to his colleagues. She can cheat on him. She can, she can uh, purposefully, ostentatiously cheat on him and let him know that she's cheating, to hurt him. She, she, can, do, she can do anything. There's no limit to what a borderline can do once she perceives rejection and converts it counterfactually to abandonment. It's a cascade. And she's not in control. She's not in control. It usually becomes so extreme that many borderlines dissociate because they know they are doing wrong. They, they know what they're doing is wrong. They know that they're hurting a person who loves them, but they can't stop. So they forget about it. They cut it off. They dissociate it. And the next morning, the borderline can say, I don't remember what I've done. I, I don't absolutely don't remember. I, I really I did this. I can't believe I did this. And she feels ashamed and guilty. And so it's very ego dystonic. The histrionic, um, another type of patient, uh, cluster B patient, which we we increasingly think is actually a psychopath. So we, generally, we we are looking now at cluster B, and we think that they are essentially, first of all, essentially there is a spectrum. And that most people have, a, most patients have a mixture of all, all what we used to call personality disorders. So some, most people are, are uh, uh, in a small, in a small way, narcissistic, um, somewhat antisocial or psychopathic, somewhat borderline. We, we believe every every cluster B patient. We believe there should be a cluster B personality disorder, one, with different emphases and dimensions, not like today these distinctions, because the comorbidities are enormous. Most psychopaths are narcissists. So why why the distinction? <laughs> why don't we say there's a narcissist who will go that far, and there's a narcissist who will go much further, and that's a psychopath, you know? Or why don't we say there's a psychopath who can feel can can have who has emotions? That's a borderline. Why don't we say there's a psychopath who regulates has self-esteem and and self-confidence? Uh, via flirtation and, and seduction and ostentatious displays uh, of emotionality and puts uh, and her appearance and that's the histrionic. I mean, well, increasingly, we think that all of them are actually one big soup, one big salad. But the histrionic would tend to interpret rejection as a blow to self-esteem. The histrionic interprets everything as as having to do with her self-esteem. And self confidence. She regulates the self esteem and self confidence via conquests, via the chase. She is a teaser. She is not really interested in sex or intimacy. She is interested in the process of getting there, getting to sex and intimacy. Actually, most histrionic women are frigid. They don't like sex. So the histrionic woman is, is the woman in the party who would appear half naked and then she would flirt with all the men, including married men, in front of their spouses. And then she would try to seduce someone, also in front of the spouses. And, but then she would stop. She would tease them and stop. She's, she interprets rejection as a dis, as dysregulatory. It dysregulates 
her sense of self-worth. It, it renders her sense of self-worth fluctuating. So exactly like the narcissist, she would resort to, to men, for example, uh, to seduction, to flirtation, to regulate her sense of self-worth. In many ways, seduction and flirtation and so on are her narcissistic supply. That's the way histrionics react to rejection. You reject a histrionic, within seconds, she will find another man and she will seduce him and flirt with him in front of you. Uh, just to show you that she's desirable, that you were wrong, how wrong you were, and that she doesn't need you. She's independent, she can do anything she wants. Now, all these types, all cluster B personality disorders, somatize. Let me, let me talk about, a bit about the concept of somatization. Essentially, there are two pathways. Some people communicate with their minds through their bodies. And some people communicate with their bodies through their minds. In other words, some people first think. They have cognitions, they have emotions, they analyze, they have memories. They, and then this has effects on their bodies, or they make decisions regarding their bodies. To drink, to exercise, whatever. And some people are exactly the opposite. They have no access to their minds. Because, for example, the mind contains too much pain. So they don't want to go there. They are dissociative. They keep forgetting everything. They are discontinuous. They have problems with the regulation of emotions. Their moods are labile. So they, they don't want to go there. They don't want, their mind is like a dystopian uh, alien universe. And they don't want to enter it. What they do instead, they use their bodies to communicate with their minds. So these are the kinds of people who abuse substances, alcoholics, junkies. They introduce substances into their bodies so as to change their mood, moods, so as to regulate their emotions, so as to provide them with certain traits, for example, sociability. So they use their bodies and their bodies' reactions to substances in order to affect changes in their psyche, in their psychology. Another example is, of course, overeating or eating disorders. It's another way to regulate moods and, and emotions. And then there is, of course, the whole class of what we used to call conversion symptoms. Um, medical conditions, apparently medical conditions that have no medical reason. They are psychogenic. They are created by psychology. So someone's arm suddenly becomes paralyzed. Uh, it represents something. Freud was the first to describe not the first, but uh, popularized the concept of conversion symptoms. Of course, in hypnosis, in hypnotic sessions, we create artificially conversion symptoms. So all cluster B personality disorders, they use their bodies um, to communicate with their minds. They have no real access to their minds, ironically. They live inside their minds. But they don't have real access to their minds because they keep confusing the mind with, the, with reality, reality with the mind. It's exactly like the psychotic. The psychotic is what we call hyperreflection. It's a, psychotic is unable to tell what is his mind and what is reality. That's why he hears voices. His introjects, internal voices, are suddenly projected and externalized. And he hears voices as though they were coming from the outside. It's not very different in the case of cluster B personality disorders. They are also totally confused about in and out, external and internal. I mean, they are utterly so befuddled. So because of that, the only surefire path to regulation and access is via the body. So you would find that most cluster B personality disorders, um, for example, abuse substances. They drink or do drugs. Many of them are focused on their bodies, somatic narcissists, histrionics, bodybuilding, sex. And when they are rejected, they also use their bodies to communicate. So a typical reaction would be to get drunk. Or to do drugs or to go to the gym and you know have a, a five-hour fitness session uh, or to run uh, 10 kilometers so they, they would use their body to regulate their internal environment this is the panoply in the spectrum of reactions to rejection the human mind is by far the most complex universe there is the physical universe is not a hint of a fraction of what an average person has here inside. 
It's a powerful supercomputer. One million of them, actually. A typical brain is equal to one million supercomputers. It has more connections than all the atoms in the universe. And it's inside each and every skull. And we don't really respect and honor it. And this is what, the, what psychology is all about. Gaining this respect via getting to know this most amazing device at our disposal.